Good morning, everyone. Praise the Lord. Shall we all stand and shall we just greet one another? Yes. Wow, I, I, I can see some hugging. We, 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 we miss this hugging one another before because of COVID. Now it's coming back. Praise the Lord. As always, as I have said, an atmosphere of happiness always around God's people when they are together. So this morning as we come into His presence, we enjoy not just the joy of fellowship of one another, the horizontal relationship, but much more our vertical fellowship and relationship with our God. Shall we all pray together? Shall we just open your mouth that you can hear your voice praising God, lifting up all your thanksgiving and all your praises unto Him? Yes, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, because of your death on the cross. It makes sense that when we worship God, we can connect to Him because of the power of your resurrection and of your blood. We thank you, Father, for sending your Son. We thank you, Holy Spirit, because you are in our midst, and we pray that may all our spirits be attuned to your spirit, so that every time we utter lyrics of the song, we really feel your presence in our hearts, and we really lift up your name in the midst. We pray that this morning, truly, as we give our hearts to you, as we give our minds to you, our strength, truly, your name be glorified. This is our offering in the throne of your grace, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and everyone says, Amen.
and church, let's proclaim praise the Father.
We worship you as you are our loving God. You are wonderful and humble King. So worthy to be highly exalted of God. We give you all the praises. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> as we partake Communion once again. Our hearts are drawn to remember the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ for each and every one of us. The echoes of Good Friday's solemn journey to the cross and the joyous celebration that we have during the Resurrection Sunday may still be resonate within us, reminding us that Christ's love and victory he achieved over death. In our communion meditation this morning, let us heed to the words of Apostle Paul found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26 to 27. It says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread and the, uh, drinks the cup 
of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body of the blood of the Lord. Paul illuminates the multidimensional purpose of communion. It's not merely a ritual, but a proclamation. A proclamation of Christ's death on behalf of those who put their trust in Him. Embedded with this proclamation is the assurance of Christ's return, anchoring us hope with a future re reunion with our Christ Savior. This sacred observance serves as a bridge between the past, present, and future of our faith journey. We look back to the cross where Christ's ultimate sacrifice was made. We partake in the present, sharing the communion with our fellow believers. And we eagerly anticipate the future, awaiting the glorious return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yet, as Paul admonished, we must approach communion with reverence and self-reflection. For to partake in communion in an unworthy manner is to disregard the sanctity of Christ's body and blood. It is a sobering reminder that our actions hold weight. For they are extricably linked to the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. So therefore, let us take a moment before partaking today to examine our hearts and confess any sin to God. In doing so, we acknowledge our need for His grace and mercy, ensuring that we receive the bread and the cup so we do with our hearts we fail and spirits humbled, honoring the sacrifice that made on our behalf. May this communion be a deep reflection, renewal, recommitment to the one who gave us everything. As we partake, may we be also reminded that Jesus Christ sacrificed and it may, may it strengthen us to walk faithfully in godly ways until He comes again. So let us take the bread and the cup together. As we prepare to give our tithes and offering, let us reflect on the guidance of Apostle Paul regarding giving. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, each man should give what he decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly, but under or under compulsion, for God's love a cheerful giver. Let our giving be a reflection of our gratitude and generosity within our hearts, really and joyfully given. So plus on the screens are ways how to give our tithes and offering. We can give through online banking or we can also drop at the box here in front after the service. Let us give generously and sacrificially.
Praise the Lord. Good morning, church. Let's continue to come together to pray. And uh, for this morning, congregational prayer is a little bit different and special because uh, in our midst, we, we have a lady who's going to share her testimony. And some of you, you know, you've been in the church for a while, you might know uh, this lady because she had been in Canaan Church uh, for quite a number of years, uh, some years back. And this week, she had been back uh, for a short weekend, and she would like to come to, to uh, stand here to share her testimony and how the Lord had journeyed uh, with her. And, and her name uh, is Sally, right? And Sally, and so I just want to like to uh, Sally invite Sally to come here and to share her testimony with all of us. And after that, I, I would like her, her to also share uh, one or two prayer uh, items that she would like the church to be uh, praying for her. Okay? Yeah? So, um, Sally. Let's, let's have the testimony uh, right now. I think we need to flash out the... Yeah, thanks. Okay, come. Let's put our hands together to invite <laughs> Sally. Hello, good morning, church. Uh, my name is Sally. So happy to be here. Um, I came to Canaan Church 16 years ago in 2008. Uh, I became a Christian in 2009, and I was baptized in 2010. Uh, some of you were witnesses to the process. Some of you saw me in worship ministry last time for a short while or our mission trips. Uh, however, uh, there was much more happening behind the scene. So I'm here today to testify and to give thanks to God for what he has done for me over all these years. So uh, I have always been a person with a lot of inner conflicts. By nature, I'm a very laid-back person, and I couldn't care less about success. Yet, on the other side, before I knew Christ, and in those early years as a Christian, my whole self-worth was built entirely on my performance, or on how uh, some people think of me. And when... Uh, these two facets are put together. I was a master of, of uh, the procrastination. So I like to drag things until the last minute, and then I will be working on it day and night. Also, uh, plus, due to certain incidents that happened in my childhood, I had a profound mistrust of people. So I pushed people away because I was too afraid that they would reject me. Yet, I craved people's approval. So all these elements added up. I lived a very chaotic life. I was like a pressure cooker where stress was building up, yet I did not know how to deal with it. And I used various coping mechanisms to try to hold things together. And I only re uh, realized that things began to spin out of control. So that was in year 2013. Uh, I was at the end of myself, yet it was there uh, where God met me. Then it began my journey towards wholeness which was lengthy and messy and exhausting, but totally worth it. And I must admit that my arrogance and my disobedience actually pretty much prolonged this process substantially. I didn't really listen to God or those godly people got had put around me. But nonetheless, when I was faithless, God was still faithful. He bound 
my wandering heart with his love through people, through events and circumstances. His grace, his mercy and steadfast love for me were beyond my understanding. I experienced firsthand the healing power of the resurrected Jesus. Uh, last week, on that Friday after the Good Friday service, I went to some church members' home for dumplings. Uh, when I was sitting there, very comf comf uh, comfortable, having a very good time, I thank God because I knew that I was unable to do so before, even seven years ago. And I also want to thank Canaan for the warmth and hospitality you have extended to me all these years. I was often uh, either too self-absorbed or too biased to appreciate your kindness. But I know that you have been very kind to me always. And ultimately, I want to thank God because it is from Him all blessings flow. And I said at the beginning that I was a person with a lot of inner conflicts. And uh, I still have inner conflicts these days, but of a different kind. It is the evil within me that presses me downwards. I hate sin, yet I love sin. When I am to do good, evil is with me. I notice that I am so much forgiven, but I have so little love for Jesus. I have such great privileges as a Christian, but I live a life so miserably below them. And I see uh, evil uh, growing out of my heart, opening its mouth to devour me. And I seem so powerless to contain it. Um, what Paul says in Romans 7 resonates with my experience almost daily. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. But then Paul writes, Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. The only way for me to pacify this struggle in my heart is to remember that Jesus died and is risen. Here my hope revives and I have peace in my heart. For though I am evil on my own, I am complete in Jesus. He is my wisdom, my righteousness, my redemption, and sanctification. On this rock I stand. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Come on, let's give Sally a big hand. Truly, God is ever transforming. God is good. God is awesome. God changes people's lives. And even as we heard her, t her testimony, I think we are, we are hearing that she's also on her journey. She continues to experience the power of the gospel. And that's what it's, it's all about. The gospel tells us that while we are weak, the strength is made perfect in our weakness. Therefore, we constantly need to gaze upon the resurrection power of Jesus Christ as we continue on in this journey as a disciple of Christ. So we thank God for her transformation and even in that year that she was here in, in Canaan, I, I had a little bit of uh, you know, involvement in her journey as well. I actually was the, the one you know, to share a little bit of drum playing uh, with, with her at that time. And here, I, I, see, I see the transformation. I see it slowly, but I see it surely. And it's all because of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So she, she would like uh, us to be praying for her in, in her continuous uh, Christian journey here. So I would like her to just share with us one or two prayer uh, prompters, and then after that, I will ask uh, the, as the body of Christ to really stand together with her in prayer 
uh, as we pray for her. All right. So maybe Sally can just share one or two uh, prayer items. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think if God's willing, uh, very soon I will probably embark on a new endeavor. So uh, I have a lot of decisions to make, uh, and also a lot of struggles. So amidst all this, I just want to be pray that it is God's will be done, not my will. And I will learn to surrender and to obey Him, and also uh, be willing to die to myself and to take up the cross and to be strong and courageous. Right. Should we all stand right now as we, we pray for, for Sally? And this is not just only a, a local church here in um, the St. George's area, but we know that God has brought forth different people from all over the world as the bigger family, as a bigger body of Christ. And we want to right now stand together with Sally as the body of Christ, as the family of God, as we pray for her. All right. So if we can, just stretch our hands to her as, as we pray. Father, I thank you, O Lord that you are a God of a resurrecting power. Jesus, you have risen from the cross and that you have the power to transform us from death to life. And today, as we hear this testimony, O oh God, we are hearing, O oh God, of you once again coming to save horrible sinners like all of us. And here, with humility, once again, we want to lift up Sally into your hands, Lord. We thank you for the work that you have done in her life we thank you for the work that you continue to do in her life. And we thank you, Lord, that you have opened up her heart and her mind, Lord, to you, what you have done to the glorious picture of Jesus Christ and of the gospel, and that she continues to gaze upon you and you alone. Truly, O oh God, that in her struggle, in her weaknesses, in the challenges that she faces, Lord, that she continue to experience your grace. She continue to experience your power flowing, Lord, to her as she learns to surrender. Lord, that you have called this life that you have called us is a life, a calling to die, to die to self, to deny ourselves, to take up the cross and to follow you. So I pray, O oh Lord, for her, that in the days ahead, Lord, that as, she, as you lead her, O oh God, in the, those plans and that may seem a little bit fuzzy, it's not clear, but Father, I pray that you will give her the faith and that she will learn to trust you all the way, Lord. She will learn to listen to your voice. She will learn, O oh God, to immerse herself in the Word of God and to immerse herself in the presence of God and that she will be led by you. Lord, your Word tells us that many are the plans of a man's heart, but it is you who determines our steps, O oh Lord. That where should we go? What should we do? Is it today or tomorrow? Lord, we know that our lives are in your hands and Sally's life is in your hand. So I pray that she will learn to submit. She will learn to surrender, O oh Lord. In her struggles, in, in, the, in the uncertainties of her lives, Lord, she will learn to trust you. So Father, may you, may you continue to journey with her. May you, Lord, steer her away from the ways that will detract her from the will of God. Lord, that her only desire, O oh God, I pray, is to do the Father's will. And Father God, I pray that even, even we know that it will be hard, but God, that you will give her the strength, the endurance, the perseverance to say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. So God, give her courage, give her boldness, Lord, in her obedience to the, the continuous journey in you. And may you use her life, a life that is broken but is restored by you. May you use this life to glorify the Son Jesus Christ, who has done it all for us so that the world may see you in her. She will, it will be less and less of her, but more and more of you in her life for the glory of God. This we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thanks, Sally. So um, tomorrow she'll be leaving already. And so if, for those of us who know her, please do say your highs and uh, not the goodbye, but see you later. All right? Praise God. Amen. Good morning, church, once again. 
Welcome all of us uh, to our 10 a.m. morning service, both on-site and online. And I also want to really take the time to welcome, uh, especially if you are first time here, if somebody has invited, uh, somebody from a church has invited you to the church, I uh, want to welcome you. And also this morning, we, uh, we have uh, friends among us, uh, friends from overseas, and I see some of them, and I want to acknowledge them. And so church, help me welcome them. I, I do see uh, Jenny and Alice uh, sitting with us. So can you raise your hands? Yeah, so... We want to welcome them. Praise the Lord. Welcome back home here. This is always home uh, wherever you are. And also, I want to acknowledge uh, Adam and Mel and, and also the two boys. Yeah, so Adam and Mel at the back. So they are our missionaries, uh, YWAM, you with a mission, and they are here for a short rest uh, in, in the midst of after a very long uh, ministry uh, period that they, they had. Uh, so they are here resting, and I'm so glad to see you here. I'll talk to you after that, right? Yeah. So, thank you, God, for bringing your people to us. Some announcement very quickly. Number one is that after the service, the Gen 1 ministry, they're having their Healthy Generation a teaching series that starts today. So, please be praying for them um, that they will be going through a series where we, we are going to equip them to understand what it, means, uh, what it means to be a healthy generation in terms of their journey as, as singles, their journey, as um, you know, a dating journey, and also in marriage, and in raising up family, forming family, what is the biblical perspective of that? So we are laying a foundation uh, for the, our young people because we really believe that they are important to us. So we are taking the time to invest in them, uh, to raise them up so that they become the gospel lighthouse in their understanding of how to live out their lives uh, in this area of, of uh, family. Um, so please be praying for them uh, starting today, all right? The other thing is also the St. Louis residents, we continue our outreach to our healthcare workers, uh, the, the staff over there. So please also be praying as Pastor Larry continue to lead uh, the team to, to, to go over there and to minister to the healthcare workers and pray for the gospel seed uh, to be planted uh, in them as, as we ask the Lord to minister them to, to them with the power of of God's word and his gospel. Amen? Praise God. Are we ready for the word of God? Yes? Let's bow our heads right now. Uh, let's, let's pray. Father, I give thanks, O Lord, to you. You are a good God. Today, we pray that we will once again only see your Son, Jesus Christ, and the glorious message of the gospel. Lord, we have just celebrated Easter last, last week. And we know, O oh Lord, that without the resurrection, our faith is empty. Our preaching is in vain. So today, we thank you, Lord, as we are on, continuously on this journey and discovering you, as we look at the life of your Son, Jesus Christ. God, may you illuminate in our hearts something that will ignite a fire on the inside of us today that will burn brighter, stronger, more zealous and passionate for you. So we ask that you open our hearts this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Let me start with a, a story that I heard recently. That a story was told of a, a lady, a passenger who booked a Grab car. So it's, it was an ordinary day for her. She was on her way to work. She booked a Grab car. And then during the, the ride, you know, she wanted uh, to ask the, the driver a question. And so what happened was that she actually just leaned over, very ordinary, she just leaned over, you know, and gave a, a, a gentle tap on the shoulder to get the attention of this uh, Grab driver. And lo and behold, all of a sudden, the driver screamed at the top of his lungs. He screamed, and then he lost control of his uh, Grab car. You know, the car swore, almost hit uh, a, a bus, and then it, the, the driver mounted the curb, and then, you know, stopped right in front of, of a shop just, you know, meters uh, before crashing to the, the shop. It, 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 it was a, a, a near miss. And there in that moment, there was uh, silence. There was some silence there, and they were just kind of reeving in uh, of this thing that just happened. And for a few moments in their silence, after they kind of picked themselves up, the lady passenger feeling very, very apologetic. Of course, she was still shaking on the inside. And then she asked, or rather she told 
turned to the driver and said, you know, I am so sorry to you for causing this, for causing this panic. But I mean, I just gently tap on you only, you know. But why? And, and then the driver, the grab driver turned to her and said, you know, ma'am, you don't have to be apologetic. I should be the one saying sorry to you, you know, for causing this to happen to you. Say, you know, no, 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 no. I'm the one I should say sorry to you. You see, ma'am, today is my first day of driving the Grab. My first day. But you know what? For the past 25 years, I've been driving a hearse. You got it, right? I mean, if you are the, the person, you'll be, you'll be afraid, right? Somebody tap on you. You've been driving in the hearse for the past 25 years. Somebody has risen alive in a coffin be, behind you. You should be shocked. Last Sunday, on Easter, we saw that Jesus was resurrected from death to life. And of course, we don't have to be shocked with this. We should be rejoicing with this, amen? Somebody say amen, come on. Today, we will continue on in this journey here at looking at the life of Jesus, His life. Remember two, two years ago, we started on this entire narrative of the gospel that starts from the Old Testament that we brought you through, starting from Genesis all the way. Uh, two years ago, we finished the Old Testament. Now we are on the life of Jesus. We continue on that we don't stay at the resurrection point, at Easter, but we begin to see that the life of Christ continues to manifest powerfully even after His resurrection. Today, we will see the resurrected body of Jesus where He encountered two disciples along the road to Emmaus. Everybody say Emmaus, come on. And how Jesus lifted their dejected and discouraged hearts and put a fire onto the inside of them, in their hearts, that was extinguished because of the dejection that they felt because they thought that their Saviour is no more. And now, today, in this message, we will also see how the fire in our hearts today can keep on burning when Jesus walks with us, all right? So I want to pick the story here in Luke chapter 24, picking up from verse 13 and 14, it says here, That very day, Two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Now, seven miles is about 11 kilometers, okay? And verse 14, it says, And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. That very day, now that's how it starts, that very day, it was the same day that Jesus was resurrected. It was on the Lord's day, and it was on the same very day that the two disciples, one named Cleopas and the other one unknown, they were on the road to Emmaus. Now, scholars have different views about who they are. Some say they are a couple, they are going home. Some say you know, they are one of Jesus' disciples. But whatever it is, we see two persons down here. They were on the road to Emmaus and they had to walk 11 kilometers before they reached this place called Emmaus. So, imagine with me right now the euphoric was over. It was gone. Jesus was crucified on the cross and died. And these two persons, they didn't know about the resurrection yet. And now, they were probably on their way home and feeling very, very disappointed. What do you do when you experience disappointments in your life? Right? All of us, we at every point or at certain points in our lives, we will experience disappointments. So what do we do? I want, I want to share this with you. Number one, if you were taking notes, write this down. Is this that as we see that the risen Jesus drew near in the disappointment of the two disciples. They drew, Jesus drew near. And as we walk alongside the disciples on the road to Emmaus, we want to witness what Jesus did for the two of them. And here we see, we witness the profound disappointments of the, the two disciples. Their conversation must have revolved around the death of their Savior, the Messiah, Jesus. You know, imagine with me now, their expectation was shattered because of what happened at the crucifixion. Think with me here, what a letdown, right? For three and a half years, 
that they were trekking with Jesus as their followers and the disciples. And here we, we see that it all came to nothing. Imagine that you're following somebody for three and a half years, believing that person, what he, he said, and it came to nothing. How would you have felt? In verse 17 of chapter 24, it says that they were sad. They looked sad. They must be. Their hearts were discouraged, heavy with sorrow and confusion, much like us when we experience or face disappointments in our lives. John C. Maxwell had a quote, and he said this. He said that something about disappointment. He said, disappointment is the gap that exists between expectation and reality. Disappointment is the gap that exists between expectation and reality. In other words, no expectations, no disappointments. If you have no expectation, there is no disappointment. But how many of you know that all of us, we do have some expectations in life, right? That is a part of human life. That's life. And having hopes, having some kind of expectations keep us going, you see? So we continue to look at verse 21. Look, Luke chapter 24, verse 21 says, But we had hope. Everybody say, we had hope. Come on. So I want you to see this. But we had hope that he was the one that redeemed Israel. So here, there was this conversation going on. And they were recounting what happened here. And they told Jesus, we had hope that he was the one to redeem Israel. How many times have you found yourself speaking to yourself, I have hope. I have hope. And that you have been disappointed. You said, you know, God, I have hope. And again and again, you have been disappointed. I have hope that I am healed. But then, you're not healed. I have hope to get this job. I have hope to get into this school. I have hope that my relationship with so-and-so will be better. Maybe today, you're struggling with that right now. In your heart, there's a turmoil. You say, I have hope that this thing is happening to me, but it's not happening. The comforting news for all of us is this. The Lord Jesus Christ drew near in their disappointment, and we can find hope in this. When we see Jesus drawing near, many times in our disappointments in our lives, many times be in our relationship, be in because of something that didn't happen to us that we are hoping for, we don't realize that the Lord Jesus is nearer than we think. That Jesus is actually very near to us in our disappointment. And we need to be reminded of the gospel truth that because of the gospel, because we are a child of God, the Christian has got the promise is that God is always with us, whether it's high or low in our life. Jesus, God it will never abandon us. And that is the promise that God has given to us in the Word of God. Somebody say amen, come on. That is the promise to us, all right? In our disappointment, the Lord drew near. Let's read on. In verse 15 to 16, it says, While they were talking and discussing today, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. You see, Jesus not only drew near, he was walking with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing them. Interestingly, Jesus appeared and they could not recognize him, right? Could it be because Jesus was so disfigured from the crucifixion that they cannot recognize this disfigured person? I don't think so, because in the scriptures, in the word of God, as you go back and read this carefully, it tells us that scripture said that their eyes were kept from recognizing Jesus. The Lord did it. Now, why did he do so? Why did God keep them from recognizing him? I want you to imagine with me right now that you're in the office, in a very typical scene at the office pantry, right? You know, the colleagues are talking we want another, and uh, you know, the typical scene, right, that uh, they are gossiping about their boss. Imagine that, okay? Uh, they are gossiping, gossiping about, you know, bad, you know. Then all of a sudden, standing behind, the boss turns up. What happens? Gossip stops. Correct? Yeah? The gossip stops right away. Similarly, think, imagine, very similar, it's like this. Jesus kind of steps in here, and, and he kept them from recognizing him because 
he really wanted, I believe, he wanted to hear the honest conversation between these two persons. What were they really honestly talking about? And some more, he acted blur, you know. He acted blur. Go back and read this in verse 19 to 25. Uh, so he went over and started talking to them. Uh, actually, what, what thing? Uh? What, what happened here? And then the two disciples said, don't you know what had happened over the past three days? This thing that is, you know, in the central news in Jerusalem, this Jesus that was crucified, don't you know? And Jesus said, what things? And somewhat cheeky down there, right? What happened here these few days? Because Jesus wanted to really hear what is really in, down there in their heart. And then, point number two, is that this reason Jesus pointed to his word in their disappointment. Now watch, this is where it gets very interesting here, with how Jesus lifted it up. The two disciples told Jesus why they were disappointed. They could not recognize him yet, right? So he, he, they, they were telling him, I'm so disappointed, I'm so sad with this, you know, this, what had happened with this Jesus that we had just followed. And I want you to notice, if you go back and read verse 19 to 25, go back and read that, you will notice something very interesting here. Notice the disciples started to use the past tense as they were recounting. He said, they were saying, Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed. He was a prophet who was a prophet mighty indeed. It was a past tense. Now, to the two disciples, Jesus was a past tense already. Can you see that? He was, not is, he was the prophet, the mighty prophet that they trusted, but no longer. He was mighty indeed. And so what happened here is this. We see that they were pinning their hopes on Jesus hoping that he was the one who would deliver and to redeem Israel. But it never happened as far as they understood at that point. It never happened. And three days have passed already since the crucifixion, since the Jesus, the Messiah had, had, had died. It was gone case already. Have you ever heard yourself mutter this in your heart? If you're honest with yourself, you say this to yourself, he was. God was and not is. You used to say, you know, he is my healer, but now you're saying he was my healer. You used to say God is my provider, but now you're saying he was my provider. I mean, you used to say he, he is my deliverer, but now in your disappointment, you're honest with yourself, you say he was my deliverer. Basically, you're saying he is God, but now he was God. Do you feel like that? This morning, if you are feeling like this way right now, maybe in a particular area in your life, be it in a, in a, with a family, be it relationally, whatever it might be, you may be feeling this way, that to you, God was. Perhaps you need to hear the words of God, what Jesus is saying here. You need to hear the gentle rebuke of Jesus Christ from our Lord Jesus to the two disciples. Let's read on here. Verse 25. Listen to the words of Jesus here. Don't miss this now. He said to them, O oh, foolish ones, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Now, I want you to watch here. This verse says, those you who are slow of heart, can you see that? Those you who are slow of heart. In other words, what tells me is this, our faith in God got different speeds, one, you know. Some are slow, some medium speed, some fast. And Jesus said here, you are slow, you're not fast, you're slow of heart, right? Maybe your eyes are not seeing Jesus in the scriptures, but rather your eyes are seeing Jesus in the way that you want to see him in the way that you're hoping for, just like how the disciples, these two disciples, they were not seeing Jesus fully. That's why they went away disappointed. What if your picture of Jesus Christ is very different from the real Jesus in the Bible? I want you to take a look at this picture here. It's a very famous picture called the head of Christ. Okay? Now, yeah, that's the picture here. It is painted by this person by the name of 
a Warner Salmon in 1941, okay? This picture of Jesus was so popular, so famous, it, that it was printed 500 million copies and people bought it at that time. It's probably one of the most popular so-called portrait of Jesus at that time and probably one of such hanging in a Christian home somewhere, somehow at the time, among, even right now, among the elderly Christians here. Okay? How many of you, right, by show of hands, you have seen this picture before? Yes, yeah. How many of you, okay, perhaps, perhaps, yeah. How many of you, you have uh, someone you know that have this picture in their house right now? You look around, yeah? You see, some of us, right? My, my, the, you know, my wife's aunt has one in a house. And some recently, when I, I, I paid a visit to uh, Pastor Mark, I, I went to a house, I think it was last, end last year, I also saw one portrait like that in a house. <laughs> the same picture, okay? It's now, you know, this is called the Head of Christ, painted by uh, Warner Salmon, okay? This is the Jesus that was imprinted in people's mind, all right? Blue eyes, long hair, perfect complexion, very, you know, Caucasian-looking, fair skin, long, smooth, flowy hair. That's the picture of Jesus. So what happened was this. In 2002, in 2002 Richard Neve, a retired British uh, anatomical artist, what he did was this. He used forensic data from the skulls of the first century Jewish uh, people, men. What he wanted to do was to recreate what Jesus would have looked like back then 2,000 years ago. And guess how, what they found out? This is what probably how Jesus would have looked like. Let's take a look. This is probably what Jesus would have looked like. Disappointed, right? What happened to the blue eyes, long hair? What happened to that? Are you disappointed? Yes? Now, the consolation for all of us is this, as you are disappointed, you, I want you to know the consolation is you are probably better looking than him. La. You are probably better looking than Jesus, right? The problem is this. What's my point here? The problem is we want God to be what our desire tells us, right? We want God to be what our desire tells us and not what Scripture tells us. We form an image of Jesus in a way that we want to see what we want to see and not what Scripture tells us. So the question for all of us is this, as we, as we listen. How serious are you in studying the Bible about the different subjects in the Bible? For example, how serious are you in studying about healing? If you are going through some sickness and experience physical ailments in your life, how serious are you studying the Bible about healing? How serious are you studying in the Bible about how God provides for you? How serious are you studying how, who God is and who you are, what He has commanded us to do, what His promises to us are, and what He did not promise us that we are claiming on? How serious are we studying the Word of God? Now, if you would seriously, if you would seriously take the time to study God's Word for yourself, now, as in literally study God's Word. Open up your Bible and study God's Word for yourself. Like how you will imagine, like, you know, some of you, you may have forgotten when you were a student, and some of you are still students here, that you will study God's Word as if you are, like, studying for your O-level exams, as if you're studying, like, for your A-level exams, as if you're studying for, like, university exams. Would, if you would seriously study the Word of God like some kind of major exams that you are hinging your entire life on it, you might discover a very different Jesus in the Bible. You might discover a very different Jesus from your perspective or your perception that you have, or worse, your misconception of Him as you study the Word of God. Now, I think, I think Jesus here is extremely gracious to the two disciples. And that's how I, I believe that that's the heart of Christ for all of us here as we continue to walk with Him as disciples of Christ. In the depths of their despair, Jesus gently rebuked their two disciples and pointed them back to the Scriptures. He didn't, you know, scolded them and then 
left them there. He didn't leave them there, but he gave them the solution, but he pointed them back to the scriptures. And today, perhaps, Jesus is rebuking some of us here. Now let's watch verse 27. And beginning with Moses, let's see what Jesus did. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning who? Himself. Concerning himself, Jesus. So Jesus gave the two disciples, he opened up scriptures for them and gave them a Bible study. Starting from Moses, I imagine, now imagine with me right now, in that conversation when Jesus gently and now lovingly began to open up scriptures and interpreting for them. How is that, right? For Jesus himself to interpret the scriptures for, for, for them. Imagine that Jesus did it for, for, does it for us. So here we see the Bible study was being opened starting from Moses. I imagine Jesus start to bring them to the book of Exodus about Moses and the Passover lamb and how they are to paint the, the doorpost and the lintel with the blood of a lamb. And then, then he began to point them that he is the ultimate Passover lamb. And maybe he began to also point them to Numbers chapter 21 and talk about the bronze serpent, you know, that, that the God told the Israelites as they were bitten by the poisonous snakes, erect a bronze serpent. As you gaze upon this bronze serpent, you will be healed. And that is repeated in John chapter 3, verse 14, verse 15. And then in the verse 16, the very famous one, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life, right? Go and read the few verses before, it's talking about the bronze serpent. And Jesus is telling them, as the Israelites gaze upon the bronze serpent, uh, you know, and they got healed, likewise, even so, that the Son of Man got to be lifted up, that Jesus is your Messiah. He's pointing scriptures and telling them that He is the one. And perhaps, you know, Jesus continue on in verse Psalms 22, if you read Psalms 22, and then he kind of mapped out exactly, started reading it and mapping the exact match of the crucifixion details. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's how Psalms 22 starts. Mapping them out and then maybe he went to prophet, the mighty prophet Isaiah in verse 50, chapter 53 that reads, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And then imagine Jesus said, This is exactly what I went through for you on the cross. Can you imagine what Jesus was doing? on the road to Emmaus with the two disciples. And you know what? What that did to the two disciples, my last point here is this. The reason Jesus ignited a fire. The reason Jesus ignited a fire within them in their disappointment. What did Jesus just do in the Bible study? What did he just, did? What did he just do? He unfolded the gospel for all of them. That is why I said, that we need to understand what the message of the gospel is, not just in the New Testament, but also see the gospel in the, the, the Old Testament. The gospel is not just A, B, C. The gospel is A to Z of life. And here we see Jesus unfolding the gospel to them. He was lifting them out of their disappointment with the message of the gospel. And something very interesting happened here, verse 32. Now watch. In verse 32, it says, they say to each other, now they begin to turn to one another after the Bible study of, you know, conducted by Jesus. They, they said, they ask one another, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road? Did not our heart burn within us while we talked to us on the road? While he opened to us the scriptures. You see, what is happening here is this, the word of God is giving them heartburn. Now, you hear me correct? Turn to your neighbor and say, the word of God will give you heartburn. Come on, yeah? Turn to your, the other neighbor and say it one more time. The word of God will give you heartburn. Come on, yeah? 
I am not talking about the heartburn that some of you, you know, experience. I'm not talking about the discomfort or the irritation caused by the stomach acid, right? It's not that. It is not the physical heartburn, but the spiritual heartburn. There is something burning on the inside of us. In other words, there is a glow, there is a burning, that your heart is on fire when you encounter Jesus. Now, that is how this term is used, right? When, when someone is madly in love, right? You know, we, we say, wow, these two persons, they, they are on fire for one another, correct? You say that. You said, you know, so-and-so about this, this uh, person who is zealous for the Lord. We said, this person is on fire for the Lord, right? And the, the Methodist pastor, John Wesley, said about his own conversion experience, he said, I felt my heart strangely warm when he encountered Christ through his conversation, through his conversion, when he had the gospel preached to him. Now, this is the real need in the church today. And I want to end with this. There is a real need in the church today. Because in our modern Christianity today, we have a lot of information, tons of information. We have resources at our fingertips. You know, you can get them online. You can Google, Google them on your phone. You have immediate access to any, if you have a phone with you, you get access immediately to any Bible verse any, any teaching, any video re resource, any Christian song that you want to uh, Google out, it's so easy. But the problem is this, what we are seriously lacking in the church today, in the Christian church, is the burning fire. It's the burning fire of the Lord. The passion. Where is the fire? Where is the spiritual passion for the Lord? I think they're seriously lacking in the church today as I see it. You know, Jesus said, many are called, right? Can you fill in the blanks? But few are chosen. But I would say this, many are believers, but a lot of them are frozen. Have you ever seen frozen chickens in a supermarket before? Recently, some months back, I started to learn to cook and that was the first time I, I entered into this arena, in this department that in the supermarket I never ever go to for the past, you know, 30 years of my life. And then as I walked at looking at the chickens, right, oh, all frozen, you know. Is our life like that, without the fire, cold, frozen? The question for all of us is this, church, what caused this heartburn? This passion burning within the two disciples. The Bible didn't say, didn't our hearts burn within us while he looked at us with those eyes of his? The Bible didn't say that. Neither did the Bible say, didn't our hearts burn within us while we talked to him? He didn't say that. Now what did the Bible say? It says this, didn't our hearts burn within us while he talked to us? While he opened the scriptures for all of us. Jesus was talking to them and Jesus opened the scriptures to them. My encouragement, my challenge to all of us is this, church. Open your Bible. Study the Bible. Study your Bible every day and look for Jesus in your Bible and begin to let your heart burn as He talks to you through the scriptures. Amen? I want you to imagine with me right now. Imagine that this church is walking with burning hearts all over the place. That there are burning hearts, that there is a fire on the inside of you that's burning, full of, of God, full of the desire of God, full of the power of the Holy Spirit because God's Word is touching people all over the place. Can you imagine a church like this? that we are the disciples with the burning hearts on the inside of us. Can you imagine where does the light in the lighthouse, the gospel lighthouse come from? It is the fire that burns on the inside of us. God's Word, both the inspired scriptures and Jesus Himself. The Word made flesh changes hearts and it does not, the Word of God does not return unto us void. Somebody say amen, come on. And therefore, we should expect that abiding in God's word, when we abide 
when we study God's Word, when we apply God's Word, when we abide in God's Word, I want to guarantee you that is what you can expect. You can expect your life change, transform on the road to Emmaus, just like the two disciples. Because in God, when we abide in His Word, it will begin to result in good fruit in our lives as the Holy Spirit illuminates the Scripture for all of us that points to who? That points to Jesus Christ and an abundant and transformed life in Him. And that is my challenge for all of us as I ask all of us to stand right now all over this place. Let's just stand all over this place on our feet. My encouragement and my challenge to us as I close is this. Make a commitment to get back into the Word of God if you have never or you have taken the Word of God for granted. Your Bible is dusty somewhere in the, bi- in, in, in the, in the shelf, somewhere in the, at home. Or if you have you know, a very casual relationship with the Word of God, with the Bible, my challenge for all of us is this. Get back to the Word of God that you experience a heartburn in your life. That Jesus comes in and begins to bring that fire on the inside of you. So as you stand, I'm just going to ask Daniel to sing this song, Burn in Us. And just, would you just do business to the Lord, with the Lord as you hear this song, Burn in Us. Would you make it a prayer as you listen to this song? Let this song be translated into a prayer. Make it as a personal prayer. As you hear this and say, Lord, I want to dig in into the very words of yours. I want you to speak to me through your word so that I can experience a heartburn that will set me on fire for you, O God. right you talk to the Lord right now Ask the Lord. Burn in me, oh God. Let's cry out to Him right now. Burn in me. New strength and fire, oh God. If you can lift your hands, lift your hands to the Lord. If you can kneel, kneel before the Lord. Let us do business with the Lord. God, burn the fire on the inside of me, oh God. That's right, let's cry out. Burn in me within my soul. The strength and fire, it makes me whole. Burn in me. Let's sing it from the top. Burn it deep within my soul. Burn it deep within my soul. New strength and fire, it makes me whole. Burn it deep, deep within my soul. All across this place, how many of you, you want a deeper revelation, you want a deeper hunger for the Word of God? Put up your hands right now. That's right. All over this place. You want a deeper hunger, a deeper desire to see Jesus through His Word. Let us just pray. Father, as you see hands lifted up, some of us are kneeling, 
that you hear the heart, the cries of our hearts, O Lord. Father, right now, right here, right now, we are doing business with you. That we want to experience you like the two disciples, O Lord, on the road to Emmaus, O God. That we want to be intentional, we want to be serious with you. Come and place that fire, O Lord, that desire on the inside of us first of all. So that God, that we will place your word as the center place in our lives, O God. Father, we ask for forgiveness right now that we have been casual. That we have been casual with your word, O Lord. The very precious word that you have given to us that reveal and reveal and reveal again and again of your living word, Jesus Christ, the, the, the God made flesh walking among us. God, we are sorry that we have lived our lives on the day to day, O Lord. On the day to day, O God. That even to the point that we are not shocked. Even to the point that when the word of God come and begin to rebuild us, our hearts are desensitized. Father, forgive us. Forgive us, O oh Lord, as your people come and pray and lift these hearts and these hands, O oh Lord, to you. And so, Father, with our lifted hands, fill us with the desire right now and fill us, O oh God, with more of your Holy Spirit, O oh God. That right now, O oh God, that you do something in all of us that only that you can, Holy Spirit, ignite that fire and burn and make it whole on the inside of us right now, oh Lord. Come on, church. For one last minute, will you just pray to Him right now? Just pray. Open your mouth and just pray to Him. Say, God, renew me that there will be a, a change, oh God. There will be a new hunger. Put that fire, put that desire on the inside of me once again, oh God. That if you are new, you know, you read the Bible, you don't understand, will you pray to God, humble yourself and pray to God, God, would you bring someone alongside me and say, God, bring someone alongside me and even better still, humble yourself and say, God, will you reveal someone to me? And this week, this week, go to that someone and say, will you disciple me? Will you journey with me? We, 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 can you do Bible study with me for a season? For, for a month or so do something like that and get into the Word of God and I tell you that the, that the Jesus that we know is going to be revealed to us and that as you do the Word of God together that you will find yourself saying to each other didn't we feel that burning in our hearts as Jesus speaks to us through the Word of God don't you want that? yes so just pray. Say, God, bring me to another level of hunger and passion and desire. Lord, bring somebody to me. Lord, humble me and, and, and help me to take that step of faith, that boldness, to go and approach somebody in this church and say, brother, sister, we journey together for a season. Let's do, and let's study the Bible together. Let's pray together and let's ask the risen Jesus to speak to us especially if you are experiencing disappointment. Father, I pray for the church here. I pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray for some of us who would say that God was. I pray for them that God still is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore and build their faith right now, O oh God. And bring them to encounter Jesus right now, right here, right now, O oh Lord. So Father, once again, as we close, Lord, we desire to be that gospel lighthouse. And as gospel-shaped people, that we want to be people who are shaped and directed by the Word of God and that we will display the power of the Word of God through our transformed life. So God, please help us and ask, oh God, right now as we avail ourselves, as we, our hands still lifted up to you, God, we pray that we will be that kind of disciples that will walk knowing the Word and obeying. It's all about obedience to the Word of God. So God, this is what our prayer is. Bless us, help us. This we pray so that God, all the glory and honour and praise be unto you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and God's people say, 
Amen. Come on, give the Lord a big hand as we end right now. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless all of us. And uh, as we go in our way this week, ask the Lord to give, continue to give the hunger for the Word for all of us. All right? God bless all of you. See you next week. Amen. Darkness, we were waiting without hope, without light.